Good morning and praise the Lord. Let's thank God for this wonderful time that we have today to come again to study the word of God. We thank God for the ministry of TRC. Once again, we could come together and hear from one more servant of God, uh, Brother Benson Joseph. Um, we have been uh, hearing from him on the topic biblical theology and uh, hope uh, we remember the last time he took uh, on the book of Isaiah. Uh, in fact, for the past two, three uh, sessions, he has been taking from the book of Isaiah. And last time we heard about God's consolidation to Israel and the nations. And uh, finally, we, um, uh, we saw uh, chapter 42, verse 1 to 17, where we see the verses of hope for the Gentiles. So, God willing, our brother will continue today, this uh, this morning, and uh, we commit our dear brother into the hands of God, so that God may lead him and give him all the right words and strengthen him uh, this morning to expound from the word of God. And uh, after the message, uh, Brother Nedi Manuel will close this meeting in prayer. So, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the breath that you have given us. We thank you for all the spiritual blessings that you have blessed us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all the facilities that you have given us so that we could connect from our homes and hear uh, the word of God. Lord, we thank you for dear brother Benson who has joined us. And uh, we especially come to him so that uh, you would strengthen him uh, with all the words necessary to expound from the scriptures. Lord, we also commit each and every one of us uh, so that you may help us understand uh, what brother, uh, what you're going to speak through, brother. Lord, we also uh, want to hear your word um, uh, uh, with, with, with full focus on it so that we may be able to obey it and uh, so that we uh, will be edified, uh, so that we will be prepared uh, for thy uh, kingdom. Lord, we uh, marvel at your word that your kingdom plan is, um, uh, is, is, is seen or is revealed throughout the scriptures. Lord, how wonderfully you have chosen us in this part of dispensation so that we could really see and understand and what is revealed through the scriptures. Lord, we also hope for the things that you are going to do in this world. Lord, we also hope for uh, the uh, uh, coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, with, with, with all these things, Lord, uh, help us to uh, live a, a life that is pleasing to you, that is glorifying you in this world and in the days that you have given us uh, to to live in this world lord in this time we commit uh, all those who have joined and uh, we also uh, pray for a smooth internet connectivity so that we will be able to hear the message without any uh, disturbances lord we ask all these things uh, in the most precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen over to you brother benson Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Isaac, and uh, greetings to all the brothers and sisters uh, in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we have been considering uh, the subject of biblical theology, and as our dear brother mentioned that over the last uh, few weeks or the last few sessions, we have been considering uh, from the book of Isaiah. And uh, we began the book of Isaiah, and we uh, looked at the aspect of how uh, the, the book of Isaiah uh, is uh, is primarily about servanthood. That servanthood is one of the major themes that runs uh, throughout uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, we began by looking at the first five chapters of uh, the book of Isaiah, where we see that uh, there is a stark contrast between 
what is the present situation uh, that existed in the nation of Judah and what was God's expectation uh, in regard to what uh, one day they are going to be. And uh, the big question that we were left with at the end of uh, this section is the question as to how is it that this present Israel is going to become that glorious Israel which the Lord has called it to be. Uh, and the answer we find in the rest of the uh, book of Isaiah, but uh, the uh, a pattern is given in Isaiah chapter 6 as to what is actually needed. And there we see a call of Isaiah. And uh, within the call of Isaiah, we see uh, certain themes which run then uh, throughout uh, the entire book. And then we saw from Isaiah chapter 7 uh, to chapter 39, uh, which is centered on uh, the very basis of servanthood, which is uh, trust or putting faith uh, in God. And we find uh, and we find in this section, uh, you know, this entire section can again be divided into three subsections. And we saw the bordering sections of Isaiah chapter 7 to 12 and Isaiah chapter 36 to 39. Uh, and these two are uh, two kings and two different crises which took place during that time and uh, two very different responses uh, to their crisis. We see King Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7 to 12. Uh, there, uh, when he faced a crisis, the Lord asked him to trust in him, uh, but he did not trust in the Lord. He trusted uh, in his alliances and the uh, great uh, fall that happened because of it. And on the uh, contrary, we see in Isaiah chapter 36 to 39, uh, Hezekiah uh, uh, going, in, going through a very difficult crisis as well. Uh, again, the choice was before him. He could either, either trust in his alliances or he could trust in the Lord. And we find that I, Hezekiah chose to uh, trust in the Lord. Uh, and in the middle section, we find Isaiah chapter 13 to 35, uh, where we see certain lessons as to why is it uh, that uh, Israel must trust in the Lord alone. And uh, one of the things that we see in this section um, and, and a major chunk of this section uh, is about uh, oracles of judgment that have been pronounced against the neighboring nations. Um, and the idea is that uh, all of these nations are eventually going to uh, are eventually going to go through the judgment from God, and therefore it would be foolish for uh, Israel to trust in these nations, uh, but they must trust in the Lord alone. Uh, so we uh, so from Isaiah one to thirty nine, this is the uh, these are things that we saw, and then when we came to Isaiah chapter forty onwards, we saw first of all that. Uh, now Isaiah is not speaking uh, to the people who are in the land of Israel, but now he is addressing the people who have already gone into captivity. And here we see the uh, see the uh, how that it is God who is the author of the scriptures and He knows uh, what is going to happen in the future. And through Isaiah, He is speaking to a people uh, around 100 to 150 years uh, into the future. Um, and the message is a message of hope that the Lord uh, is still uh, one who loves Israel and He is still one uh, who is going to bring them back from captivity. And as our dear brother was mentioning last time, we looked at uh, the uh, why, uh, first of all, uh, is God desiring to bring the people of Israel or the people of Judah back uh, to their land? And then we saw that can God uh, really bring his people back to the land? And that's where we see in Isaiah 40, a great passage of scripture, which shows us uh, the greatness and the might and the majesty uh, the glory of who God is. Uh, and then we move further and there is there are two messages, a message of consolation, uh, first of all, to the nation of Israel, and then a message of consolation even uh, to the Gentiles. And we saw Isaiah 42 as one of those passages. And God willing, we'll be uh, studying Isaiah 42 a little more in detail today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, in, when we come to Isaiah chapter 40 to 55, uh, this entire section, uh, 40 to 48 is one section and 49 to 55 is one section. Uh, but both in both these sections, there are certain parallel things that we see uh, going on. And uh, in order, to, um, when we understand those parallel things going on, we would be able to uh, uh, better understand uh, both these uh, sections of uh, the book of Isaiah. First of all, we see that there are uh, two parallels uh, being given in regard to two servants of God. So we see in Isaiah chapter 40 to 48, there are about 13 references uh, to uh, these the word servant, uh, the Hebrew word servant. 
And out of these 13 references, 12 references are in regard to the nation of Israel. And there is one reference in regard to the Messiah, which we find in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1. So in Isaiah 40 to 48, 13 references to the word servant, uh, 12 of them to uh, in regard to the children of Israel, and one of them in regard to uh, the Messiah. And when we come to Isaiah chapter 49 to 55, and now it changes a bit. There are nine references uh, to the word servant in Isaiah chapter 49 to 55. And eight of those references are to do with the Messiah and one reference to the nation of Israel. So we find uh, totally there are 22 uh, such references in Isaiah chapter 40 to 55 to the word servant, uh, some of them referring uh, to the Messiah and some of them referring uh, to the nation of Israel. Uh, so we see these two servants of God in stark contrast and, and they are shown in very stark contrast. Israel as a disobedient, uh, rebellious uh, servant and on the contrary, Messiah, a obedient, submissive, a servant who is going to accomplish the purpose of the purposes of God in regard to this world. Uh, another parallel uh, thought that we see uh, in, in, in this entire section is the thought of two different crises that the nation is facing. Um, there is, first of all, a crisis, a national crisis that the nation is going through. Now, again, remember that Isaiah is speaking to people who are in the captivity. And the national crisis for them is that they are in the captivity. Uh, the land which the Lord had given to them, the land which the Lord had promised uh, way back uh, to Abraham, uh, and that land is no longer theirs. They are staying in a foreign land under a foreign uh, a kingdom, and therefore there is a national crisis that the nation is going through. But there is also another crisis that is mentioned in this passage, which is a spiritual crisis uh, that the nation is going through. Uh, that it's not just that they are out of this land and, and on the external, that seems to be the big problem, but there is a far greater internal problem of sin, uh, which exists uh, in regard to the people of the nation of Israel. So there is a national crisis and there is a spiritual crisis. And both of these are being addressed as part of uh, this entire section of Isaiah 40 to 55. One thing that uh, that in, uh, in regard to both this crisis, one thing is that God is going to bring the people out of the, both these crises. There is a promise that the Lord gives to his people in regard to both the crises that they are going through. Uh, and the uh, means through which God is going to do that is his abundant grace. Uh, and throughout this section, we see God as the primary actor in regard to all that is happening in regard to the nation of Israel, whether it is in regard to God's deliverance from the national crisis or God's deliverance from the uh, spiritual crisis, it is God who is going to do it, uh, that it is through uh, his grace uh, that the nation of Israel is going to come out of uh, both these crises. But the method that God is going to use or the servant or the vessel that the Lord is going to use are two different vessels. Uh, one, we see that God is going to use his mighty hand uh, through Cyrus, uh, that God is going to deliver his people in regard to the national crisis. But in regard to their spiritual crisis, God is going to use his uh, servant, the Messiah. And it is through atonement that God is going to bring uh, or provide a solution uh, for the spiritual crisis uh, of the nation. So on one hand, God's might uh, through Cyrus, and on the other hand, um, uh, God's grace and mercy um, and compassion on his people through uh, the atoning sacrifice uh, of his son, of the Messiah. Uh, so therefore, we see that in Isaiah 40 to 55, these parallel thoughts are going on together. And God willing, we look at, uh, at, at some of these sections and try to understand uh, how these things are going through. Now, from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 18, uh, to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 23, uh, we are presented with these two crises and the promise of God uh, to redeem the people from both these crises. Uh, so in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 18 to 43, verse 21, we see the national crisis uh, being presented. Uh, we see here, in, uh, we just um, and we'll not look at, uh, go into details of this, but possibly read a few of the verses to understand it. Uh, first of all, we see uh, that it is the uh, it is the spiritual failure or sin of the people, disobedience of the people, which has caused them to be in this captivity. 
Now, the people who are in the captivity, the question that uh, exists in their heart, and we must understand that, the question that exists in their heart is, you know, is God really, I mean, is is Yahweh really uh, the God they must be following? Because Babylon is such a, a strong kingdom at this point in time, and Babylonians are worshipping their own gods. In fact, even their emperor is to be worshipped. And uh, therefore, the big question that exists in the hearts of the uh, people of Israel is, should they still continue to uh, follow and obey Yahweh? Should, we, should they still uh, hope in him uh, because uh, he has not been able to uh, uh, he has not been able to deliver them or he has not been able to prevent them from going into this Babylonian captivity. And in this passage, we see God uh, speaking to His people and uh, speaking to them that it is uh, it is because of their sinfulness, their rebelliousness, that God is the one who has allowed them to go into this Babylonian captivity. It is not that God's hand had become weak, but it is God's punishment. It was God's judgment because of which they have they are in Babylonian captivity. Uh, we read in Isaiah chapter forty-two, and we'll just read a few of these verses. Uh, in verse 24 and 25 of chapter 42, we read, Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord? Right? Uh, he against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. Therefore, he has poured on him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. It has set him on fire all around, yet he did not know, and it burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. Despite this judgment, the people still do not understand that it is their grave sinfulness which has caused them to come to the Babylonian captivity. And that is the thought that is being uh, described here. And, but there, when we come to Isaiah chapter 43, despite this rebelliousness, despite this disobedience, the Lord is still uh, willing to love his people. The Lord is still ready to redeem them uh, from this Babylonian captivity to which he has sent them. And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, we read, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Uh, such words of comfort, um, uh, such words of intimacy uh, that the Lord has for his people. And the word there, which is uh, quite notable, is the word redeem. That the Lord is ready to redeem his people uh, from this captivity because they belong uh, to him. Um, and when we uh, move on further, uh, and we, when we come to verses 5 to 7 of um, the same chapter, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Again, a promise of a return back uh, to the land which is being made by the Lord uh, to his people. And then when we move further on, uh, the uh, Another thing that the Lord speaks to them is that, uh, and we saw this as we were thinking before as well, that uh, they must not trust or they must not think that the idols of the Babylonians uh, are the ones that are worthy to be followed or that the idols of the Babylonians um, are greater uh, than their God. And that is the thought that we see being described in Isaiah chapter 43 verses uh, 8 to 13. And we, uh, when we see here, we Verse 9 onwards, we read, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be humbled. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Um, verse 10 says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord and besides me, there is no savior. Israel must not uh, trust in uh, the Babylonian strength. Israel must not trust in the Babylonian gods. And the reason is that it is God alone uh, who is God. There is no other God. He is unique uh, in who he is. And, uh, and the comparison is given. Uh, the Lord says, you ask all these idols. Can they tell you about, you know, what are the former things that have taken place and why did they, why were they, why did they even take place? 
uh, what what was the purpose behind it uh, can they even declare it but uh, only the lord can because he he is god alone and that is a thought that we saw also in isaiah chapter uh, 13 to 35 where there are passages which uh, again compare the idols uh, to god and the thought there also is the same thing that uh, can the idols uh, describe or explain uh, the former things and can the idols predict what is going to happen in the future they cannot and it is only god alone uh, because he is god that he can explain what has happened in the past and he can explain as to what is going to happen also in the future and therefore they must trust in the lord alone again that same thought that it is god alone that they must look to for their redemption from the national crisis and then finally we see in isaiah chapter 43 verse 14 to 21 uh, a promise again that the uh, the babylonian crisis is going to be solved uh, verse 14 says thus says the lord your redeemer and the word redeemer used again it says the holy one of israel for your sake i will send to babylon and bring them all down as fugitives the chaldeans who rejoice in their ships i am the lord your holy one the creator of israel your king so again the uh, the promise that there will be a deliverance there will be a redemption uh, from this babylonian captivity that the people have gone to and we would think by the time we come to the end of this section that all is good uh, the crisis uh, that they are in uh, the lord is ready to deliver them from that crisis and they can go back to the land and everything is fine uh, but the lord does not end there uh, we see in Isaiah chapter forty-three, verse twenty-two onwards, uh, till the end of uh, till chapter forty-four, verse twenty-three. Now the Lord uh, brings before them another crisis, a crisis that um, they are not able to visualize, they are not able to uh, understand and see, and that is the crisis of their sin, uh, the deep-rooted sin, uh, which is the cause of all this uh, captivity and all that. Uh, the problems that they are going through, uh, this deep-rooted sin, which must be dealt with, uh, which uh, the, and which they themselves cannot deal with, but uh, that the Lord, through His mercy and His grace, uh, can help them uh, have victory over. And that is where we find uh, the second passage uh, from Isaiah chapter forty-three, uh, verse twenty-two onwards. And uh, we see in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 22 onwards, it reads, But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and you have been very uh, of me, O Israel. Um, and then it goes on further. And verse 24, the last part says, But you have burdened me with your sins. You have varied me with your iniquities. You have burdened me with your sins. You have varied me with your iniquities. Um, that, that's the extent uh, of sinfulness, rebelliousness, uh, that the people have committed. Uh, the Lord was very patient with them. The Lord was very merciful, very compassionate uh, to them. Uh, in fact, the prophets uh, really show the mercy of God. Uh, for uh, for a long time, the Lord kept sending his prophets to his people that they may repent and turn to him. Uh, but they did not. And uh, the Lord says that their sins have become a burden to the Lord, that the iniquities have varied him. And that is uh, describing uh, the, uh, the totality, uh, the completeness of uh, the sin of sins uh, of Israel. But verse 25 onwards, we see the promise of the Lord uh, meeting uh, even this particular crisis, even this particular need. Uh, verse 25 speaks about the forgiveness that the Lord is ready to give to his people. It says, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. The Lord is ready to forgive uh, the sins of his people. And when we come to Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3 to find not only that the Lord is ready to forgive uh, the sins of his people, but the Lord is even ready to equip them that they may be able to live a righteous life. And therefore we read in verse 3, it says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. What a wonderful um, God we have. We see that despite this rebelliousness, the sinfulness, the disobedience of his people, the Lord is still ready uh, to meet even the spiritual needs of his people. That The Lord is ready to forgive them of their sins. The Lord is ready to pour his spirit on his people uh, so that they would be able to obey him. And when we read the following verses, we understand that it says, they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water course. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write with his hand, the Lord's, 
and name himself by the name of Israel. Uh, when the Lord equips or pours out his spirit on his people, um, they would uh, be able to um, know him, understand him, and they would be able to live uh, this righteous life, which uh, was not possible for them to live before. And that is a great promise that the Lord gives to his people here, that he will meet the spiritual needs of his people. And then again, from verse, um, uh, when we move from verse 6 to 20, uh, again, there is a comparison between idols and God. Um, and in fact, uh, here we find uh, the how that the idols are actually man's imagination, uh, that they are the work of man's hands, um, and they are nothing before the Lord, and that there is only one God, and that is Yahweh alone. And then finally, we come to the last passage uh, of this section, which is from Isaiah chapter 44, verse uh, 21 to 23. Um, again, the Lord uh, promises them uh, in regard to redemption from sin. It says, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like the thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Um, and we see uh, uh, verse 23, uh, the praise to God. It says, sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. So we find uh, these two crises that the nation is going through. Uh, the promise of the Lord uh, that he would meet uh, the needs in, uh, of the people and deliver them from this crisis. Um, and then the uh, comparison between who God is and who these idols are, and that they must not trust in these idols, but they must only trust in the Lord, that they must worship only the Lord. And then finally, again, a promise of redemption uh, from the uh, present crisis. Um, so we find uh, these two parallel passages. But now the big question that comes before us as we look at this, uh, you know, the meeting of the needs of the people uh, is the question of how is it that God is going to do this? Uh, how is it that God is going to meet the need of needs of his uh, people? And that is where we find that, uh, again, two sections from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 till 48, verse 22, uh, we are presented with God's vessel. Uh, through which he is going to give national redemption uh, or uh, meet the national need of the national crisis of his people. And then the second vessel of God, uh, who is the Messiah, uh, through whom God is going to meet uh, the spiritual uh, uh, that, uh, needs of the people, how that God is going to give them a spiritual redemption uh, through uh, his servant. Uh, now in Isaiah chapter, and we'll not go into details again of this, but Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 to 48, verse 22. Uh, and this is truly amazing as we consider uh, this passage that Isaiah is speaking uh, almost 100 to 150 years before the, uh, before the Babylonian captivity and add to it another 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and maybe towards the end of that Babylonian captivity is the time when uh, Cyrus uh, would would uh, come and that they would take over uh, the uh, the Babylonian kingdom. And uh, the Lord is speaking almost 200 plus years before through his servant Isaiah, that the Lord is going to raise up 200 years into the future, a servant Cyrus. And that servant is the one through whom a vessel through whom the Lord is going to bring uh, his people uh, back uh, or he's going to uh, 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 bring them back to the land uh, that he had promised uh, to Abraham. Um, now, in this entire passage, one thought that we must understand is that it is not Cyrus might uh, which is going to bring uh, the people back to the land. Yes, Cyrus is a vessel that the Lord is using. But it is the Lord himself, it is the, by the strength of who God is, that God is going to deliver his people. And that's very clearly uh, described in, the, in this entire passage uh, regarding uh, who God is and the strength and the might and the majesty uh, of who he is. Um, when we uh, look, look at this passage, we would be able to understand it. When we, um, uh, when we look at it, uh, when we read Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 to 28, um, it reads like this, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the sign of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, 
who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, and you know the Cy Cyrus is named here, it says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Uh, verse 28, we, we are introduced to the vessel that the Lord is going to use, but the strength behind this vessel is the strength of who God is, and that is what we see in verses 24 to 27. And that's a thought that we see uh, throughout this entire passage, and that's something that we need to understand because it's very much possible that uh, we would think that Cyrus, because of the strength of uh, his army, was able to deliver the nation of uh, Israel, but uh, the Lord wanted the children of Israel to know they must not be mistaken in their thoughts that it is Cyrus by his strength who has delivered them, but it is the Lord uh, who by his own might and strength has strengthened Cyrus and allowed uh, him to be able to deliver his people. Um, and uh, we go on further, but in Isaiah 47, we find uh, the uh, song, a lament against uh, the uh, the nation of Babylon. And uh, again, you know, when we read these uh, verses, we, uh, we must remember that uh, during this time when Isaiah is actually prophesying these things, Babylon was a small nation. Uh, it had not even become a kingdom uh, till now. But the Lord has, is speaking to the people in the future and speaking how that the glory of Babylon, after it has risen up, is going to be brought down by the Lord and all that being done in order to redeem uh, his people to back uh, from the captivity to the land. So that's where we see how that God is going to meet uh, the national uh, needs of the people at this particular moment. And then we move on further and we uh, come to the past, uh, come to the thought of how is it that God is going to meet uh, the spiritual needs of his people. And that is through uh, his servant, the Messiah, that the Lord is going to do that. And uh, we find uh, that there are four servant songs uh, that are mentioned uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, and these four servant songs uh, describe to us uh, this servant, the Messiah, who is going to come in the future, and that how, uh, what is the purpose with which he's going to come, and uh, what is, uh, how is it that he's going to achieve uh, this great redemption that the Lord has promised um, uh, to his people. Uh, and uh, God willing, we would be looking at each of these songs uh, to be able to understand uh, it in a little more detail. And of course, we are not going to go into a lot of detail, but at a high level, we'll try to understand uh, each of these songs. Uh, one thing that we must understand is that each of these songs are actually uh, uh, actually, uh, actually progressive in nature. That what is revealed in Isaiah chapter 42 uh, and what is revealed in Isaiah chapter 49 uh, 49 is built up on 42, right? And then similarly, 50 is built up on 42 and 49. And finally, uh, 52 verse uh, 13 uh, till 50, uh, the end of chapter 53 is again built on whatever has been mentioned in the previous songs. Uh, so there is a progression in the revelation of who the servant is as we uh, look at each of um, these songs. So since that's that's the primary aspect uh, of of uh, this section in regard to meeting the spiritual needs we look at uh, each of these songs a little more uh, in detail uh, we first of all come to isaiah chapter 42 and from verses 1 to 9 we find the first song which has been uh, mentioned in regard to the servant uh, now, in this song, we go verse by verse and may quickly look at it. It begins by saying, it says, Behold, now there is a call uh, to the nation of Israel that they must, uh, they must pay attention. Right? When, when the word behold is used, there is a, a certain exclamation to it that the people should uh, turn their attention from whatever they are doing and that they must behold. Um, and who is it that they must behold? They must behold my servant that this is God's servant uh, who has been called by him. And uh, we see that, first of all, that this servant is the one who is the chosen servant of God, that he is the elect one. It says, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. Uh, this is a servant whom the Lord has chosen for a very specific purpose. And uh, this servant is one who is uh, in whom the soul of God delights. It says, in whom my soul delights. 
what a wonderful description uh, of the servant of God. Uh, we know that when we come to the New Testament and when we uh, look at uh, the uh, look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we uh, do see him as uh, this uh, as the one in whom the Father delighted. Uh, we do find sections in the New Testament where the Lord very clearly uh, pronounced saying that this is my beloved son, son in whom I am well pleased, that he is the one in whom the soul of the Lord delights. And this servant, uh, his desire is to do the will of God as a servant. Uh, and and that, that's the interesting thing. It does not say, behold, my king, or it does not say, uh, uh, behold, my son, but it says, behold, my servant. Uh, because, uh, because the Messiah, as the servant of God, has a very specific purpose, a very specific um, task, responsibility that is entrusted to him. And as a servant, he is going to accomplish it. Um, we, uh, we do read also in the New Testament when the Lord says, my food is to do the will of him uh, who sent me and to finish his work. Right? That is what the Lord said. So we find that uh, this servant being sent into this world, uh, the Lord choosing him to be his servant and sending him into this world with a very specific purpose. And then when we move further on, we see that he is not just the elect servant, but he is also the empowered servant. We see that uh, in the first uh, line itself, when it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, that he is upheld by the Father. And not, not only that, but it also says, I have put my spirit upon you, that he is also empowered by the spirit of the Lord. And this is a thought that we see also in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, where again the uh, Messiah is being mentioned or spoken of. And in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, we read, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So it is the spirit who is going to empower him uh, as he comes into this world and as he uh, gets into the task of, uh, of, uh, with, with which the Lord has sent him into this world. And then we see that not only that he is uh, the chosen servant of God, not only that he is the empowered servant of God, but we also see that he is the sovereign servant of God, that the work for which the Lord is sending him is definitely going to be accomplished. You know, in Isaiah chapter 42, it says, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, right? There is no question. It does not say that he may bring forth justice to the Gentiles or he will try to bring forth justice to the Gentiles, but it says he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And, uh, we, and, and we were considering this last time as well, that this is uh, in, in this particular song, uh, the focus is in regard to uh, the work that the servant is going to do in regard to the Gentiles. And we saw that the word justice is the word mishpat uh, in the Hebrew language. Uh, and it, it, uh, when we think about justice, we think about le legal equity, right? That legally everything is done. But the word justice in the Hebrew language, or specifically in regard to the scriptures, uh, speaks about the divine order that God has in regard to this world. When that divine order is met, uh, we see that justice is being met. And we find that uh, the Lord, through his servant, is going to ensure that this divine order, which the Lord uh, had appointed in uh, during creation, that uh, this divine order would be the one which would be followed, not just by the children of Israel, but also even uh, by uh, those who are the Gentiles. So he, we find that he is the sovereign servant, that he will accomplish his work. There is no question uh, about it. And then in verse 2 and 3, we read that uh, he is also a gentle uh, servant, that he is not uh, a servant who is going to come out. It says he will not cry out nor raise his voice, uh, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. Uh, he will bring forth justice uh, for truth. Here we find that uh, the gentle, the meek servant uh, being spoken about. Uh, we do read in Matthew, uh, the, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11 and verse 29 and 30, uh, where the Lord says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, we would think that when a king would come into this world, uh, that the king... Uh, King would not be one who is lowly, right? It's, it says that a bruised reed he will not break. 
a bruised reed is actually of no use it must be broken because there is no point in having it but it says a bruised reed he will not break a smoking flax he will not quench uh, it it really speaks about the meekness and the humility and the gentleness uh, with which the servant is going to accomplish his work and we see we do see that also in the gospels uh, in regard to how the lord was one who was compassionate um, and merciful and gracious uh, to the people yes he did uh, he did rebuke the hypocrisy of the pharisees um, and he did rebuke uh, at many times uh, also his disciples for their lack of faith um, but we do read uh, that he was one who uh, who did it out of love and uh, in fulfilling uh, the calling with which the lord had called him so we find that he is uh, the elect choice chosen servant he's the empowered servant he's the sovereign servant and he is also the gentle servant of the lord and then we read in verse 4 that he is the steadfast servant that there will be times of discouragement that the servant will go through and we and when we come to the following songs we would be able to see that especially in isaiah chapter 49 um there would be times of discouragement uh, for the servant um, but he would remain steadfast uh, in the calling with which the lord had called him therefore it says he will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall know shall wait for his law uh, now the word coastlands uh, or the ends of the earth they all speak about gentiles so when it says and the coastlands shall wait for his law it is speaking about people uh, who are dwelling or the gentiles uh, that how that they also shall wait for his law and the servant is the one who is going to be steadfast he is going to accomplish that work with which the lord has sent him and then finally we see from verses 5 to 9 that the saving work of the servant the very thought that we were looking at right the uh, salvation uh, freedom from sin uh, is what the people need uh, the spiritual need of the people need to be met and that is what we see in verses 5 to 9 that this servant would be one who would save his people it says what thus says the uh, thus says god the lord who created the heavens and stretched them out who spread for the earth and that which comes from it who gives bread to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it i the lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand uh, i will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people as a light to the gentiles we have been studying uh, as part of biblical theology uh, the various covenants we looked at the abrahamic the sirahitic the davidic covenant and god willing uh, in the book of jeremiah we would look at the new covenant but here it says that the lord himself the servant himself the messiah himself is a covenant to the people and that he is a light to the gentiles um, and what is the purpose with which uh, he uh, that the lord has chosen him to be a covenant and a light it says to open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from prison those who sit in darkness from the prison house i am the lord and that is my name and my glory i will not give to another nor my praise to carved images behold the former things have come to pass and new things i declare before they spring forth i tell you of them so we find that it is to bring uh, those who are in captivity captivity not in terms of uh, the physical captivity but the a uh, spiritual captivity the darkness the spiritual darkness in which the people exist that the lord is going to bring them out uh, that through by making his servant a covenant to the people and by making them a light to the gentiles and what is the response that we see uh, in regard to this song this revelation that the lord is giving in regard to his servant verse 10 says sing to the lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth you who go down to the sea and all that is in it you coastlands and you inhabitants of them the response is one of praise of glorifying of exalting uh, the lord for all that he has uh, he has planned and he has uh, declared in regard to this passage of course we are living in a time when um, the servant has has already uh, come into this world uh, and the servant has already accomplished that great work of salvation uh, by dying on that cross of calvary and we like the people of the coastlands today are able to sing praise to him for we have tasted uh, of this great salvation uh, that the lord has uh, had appointed um, uh, for us so we find in isaiah chapter 42 uh, the first description in regard uh, to the servant to the messiah the second description of 
Now, the second song we find in Isaiah chapter 49. Um, and as I mentioned that uh, this is, again, built on top of whatever has been revealed in Isaiah chapter 42. Um, so we find in Isaiah chapter 49. Now, in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 and 2. Now, uh, in Isaiah 42, it is God the Father who is calling the people uh, by saying, Behold, look at the servant. But now in Isaiah chapter 49, now the servant himself is speaking. Um, and it begins by saying, Listen. Right. Uh, so there it was, behold, now it is listen. And that actually speaks about the authority uh, of the servant, that he he demands uh, uh, authority, that when he says, listen, uh, people ought to listen, for he is uh, that great servant uh, of God. It says, listen, O coastlands, to me. Again, the call is uh, to the Gentiles. It says, listen, O coastlands, uh, to me. And it says, and take heed, you people from afar, um, and in the first two verses, we see the calling of the servant. It says, the Lord has called me from the womb, uh, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hidden me. Um, we find here uh, the call of the servant that his calling is from uh, his, uh, it says, from uh, the Lord has called me from the womb. Of course, we know that the Lord had called uh, the servant much before that. Uh, but in regard to his humanity, uh, it says that he has been called from the womb. We read in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 21, where uh, the angel of the Lord uh, came and uh, spoke to Mary. And there uh, he said very specifically that you shall call him Jesus. Uh, he will save his people from their sins right from the time uh, that he was going to be conceived uh, in his mother's womb, we find uh, that he had been appointed uh, for a very specific purpose to save his people uh, from their sins. And in the same passage, we also read about um, uh, the reference to Isaiah uh, in speaking about how he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So we find very clearly uh, mentioned in regard uh, to his calling. And then we, it says that uh, when, when we move further on, it says that he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. That uh, and, and, in, and this is in contrast to Cyrus, right? So Cyrus is going to deliver the people uh, from their national crisis by through his army, that he is going to bring his army through his strength uh, and through uh, through the military uh, strength that he is going to deliver the children and uh, the people of Israel. But here we find that this servant is going to save his people uh, through a sharp sword. And that sharp sword is his mouth, which speaks about the words that he is going to speak. That it is that this servant is going to save his people through the words that he is going to uh, declare, the word from the Lord. That he is going to be like a prophet who is going to bring the word of God uh, to his people. By the same time, it says, in the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hidden me that in many ways he is also the servant is also obscure that uh, there is obscurity in regard to him that he would be revealed only to the people uh, whom the Lord has uh, chosen uh, for him to be revealed and he will only be revealed at the time which is appointed by the Lord. We know that our Lord was in, on this earth for 30 years and uh, we see uh, he lived in uh, total obscurity. Um, and when the Lord, uh, when the time, due time had come, that he was baptized and then he, were, he went out uh, and he began his uh, ministry on this earth. Uh, and then he died on that cross of Calvary. So we find that uh, that although the Lord has called him as a sharp sword uh, to go out to his people and to declare his word to his people, um, and yet there is a certain obscurity uh, in regard to uh, his calling as well, that it would be at appointed times to appointed people uh, that the Lord has chosen. Uh, we know, especially when we come to the Gospels, there are certain passages which are spoken to the crowds and there are certain passages which are spoken to his disciples, uh, where the Lord very closely paid attention. Certain things revealed only to the disciples, um, certain truths revealed uh, to the whole uh, crowd which was following him. Uh, but when we come to verse 3 and 4, uh, we see the plight, the despair uh, of the servant. That although this great calling with which the Lord has called him, uh, but we see the, the great despair of the servant when it says, and he said to me, uh, and again, you know, this is the servant speaking. It says, and he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. 
I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Um, and that, that's the despair being described there. Uh, he has gone out, he has proclaimed the word of God uh, to the people, and yet the people have not uh, turned to him uh, the way that they should have. They have not turned to the Lord uh, as they should have. The people did not repent uh, as, uh, as, as would have been expected. Uh, we do read uh, in many passages in the gospel. One, one of those um, striking passages comes in John's gospel, chapter 6. Uh, where after having done a miracle, many crowds of people follow after the Lord. Uh, but by the time we come to uh, the end of the chapter, uh, we see that after the Lord had spoken many things to them, we read that many of his disciples, um, they did not follow after the Lord any longer, saying that his words are uh, words which are very difficult. Uh, so we find that uh, there were many people who externally followed the Lord for um, all the miracles that he was doing. Uh, they were ready to follow the Lord for all the provisions that the Lord could make for them, but they were not interested in the word, uh, the word that was, which was being brought from him. They were not ready to obey it. They were not ready to follow after it. And that is where we see the great plight and despair of the servant. Uh, he has spent his all his strength and he says it's for nothing and it is in vain. But even in this despair, even in this plight of the servant, uh, we see this excellent quality of the servant that he looks unto the Lord. It says, yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Despite uh, the children of Israel largely uh, rejecting him, uh, we see that uh, yet uh, he turns to uh, God the Father for he knows that his just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And we see that now the father responds back to the son uh, from verse 5 onwards. And in verse 5 and 6, uh, the father describes the mission of this uh, servant that although uh, the nation of Israel has rejected him, uh, yet uh, we find that the father has chosen him to accomplish a far greater purpose. It says, and now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. Now that was the primary purpose, and that was to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That the father responds to the son in his despair, and he says that it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel. But uh, I will give you also as a light to the Gentiles uh, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Here, once we are a, re a recipient of these words um, that the father has spoken to his son. And we find uh, this great mission of the son, not only to as a, uh, as a means of salvation to the children of Israel in the future, but also as a means of salvation uh, to the Gentiles today. Uh, of which we too are recipients. And we find in verses 7 to 12, uh, now the victory of uh, the servant. Again, it is the father who is speaking. He says, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor. You know, he's just, the father is describing the son. He's the one to whom uh, man despises, uh, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. The same thought being repeated again here. To restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. Again, uh, reference back to the song in Isaiah 42. They shall feed along the roads and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west and these from the land of Sinim. And the response we find in verse 13 is again one of praise. It says, sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and bring out in singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. 
Um, so we find these two songs, Isaiah 42 and 49, and God willing, we will consider Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 53, uh, which are the two other songs uh, that, uh, um, that, 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 that we see uh, which describe the servant. Um, so we saw today uh, the two crises of the nation of Israel, uh, the national crisis as well as the spiritual crisis. Uh, the means to meet both this, these crises is the abundant grace of God, that it is God uh, by his grace uh, who will redeem uh, the nation of Israel from both these crises. And we saw that the Lord is going to use two different vessels to do it. Uh, one uh, through Cyrus, and that is going to be uh, to be through a uh, military uh, of Cyrus, which the Lord is going to raise up, and the Lord is going to deliver his people from the national crisis. But on the other hand, the Lord is going to raise up his servant, uh, the Messiah, and it is through his atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary that the Lord is going to meet the spiritual needs of his people. May God help us, uh, and because of God's mercy, that this uh, this provision uh, that the Lord has given of spirit, meeting spiritual needs is not just for the nation of Israel, but it has been extended to the Gentiles like us, and that we who are prisoners of sin have been set free, and we who were living in darkness have been brought to this amazing light. May God give us all the needed grace that we may be able to respond the way uh, it is described in the scripture, that we would be able to praise him and worship him and glorify him for all that he has done for us and for all that he is. May God's name be glorified. Thank you, dear brother, for that uh, uh, wonderful explanation. Uh, we could uh, focus on these uh, four chapters uh, today morning and various themes that is running through chapter 42, 43, and 44, um, how God, uh, he uh, would bring um, the Israel back. He would bring his chosen one back. He would bring his servant back. The national crisis and uh, the spiritual crisis, uh, we've been seeing how God uh, is uh, redeeming them from Babylon and also in a parallel study, we also saw uh, how his redemption would uh, come through uh, from their sin. So spiritual redemption and the redemption from Babylon. So both we saw in parallel. Uh, also, uh, finally, uh, we saw these two uh, uh, servant songs. Behold the servant, the elected one, the empowered one, the sovereign one, the gentle one, the saving servant. So. Um, let's thank God for all the thoughts that we could uh, uh, that we could hear and enjoy this morning, and definitely, um, as the verse says, the sing unto the Lord. So, out of uh, the knowledge that we have got, so it is the worship and praise uh, that will come out of our heart. Um, let's thank God for um, blessing us this time. And we would request Brother Nidhi Manuel to close this meeting in prayer. Before that, uh, let's see uh, what we have planned for Monday. It's going to be applied ecclesiology. Uh, Brother Rajan Thomas uh, from Kerala uh, will um, uh, share the word of God. Uh, so let's join on the same time, same link, uh, with a prayerful heart. So now over to Brother Nidhi Manuel for closing. Shall we pray? <clears throat> our most loving heavenly God and our Father, we do draw nigh to thee this morning hours of another new day, the last day of the week, in and through thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ alone. Thank you for the beautiful thoughts that we received from thy scriptures in the early hours of the day regarding thy beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and thy wonderful work which thou hast planned for mankind. We thank you, Father, for all thy goodness upon each one of us, for all thy grace and thy mercies upon us, renewed for us day by day. Father, we thank you that thy words are so encouraging so edifying for us. When we seek through thy word, through thy servant as thou hast proclaimed to us, the reality when thou hast brought thy servant 
the prophet of Isaiah, to speak about thy beloved son and thy faithfulness towards thy children whom thou hast chosen. Though in their crisis, though in their failures, but yet thy promises are so true. Yet in, in, even in their failures, thou hast said, I will redeem you. What an encouraging thought it is for us. In the New Testament age, when thou hast called us and chosen us, given us that salvation through thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, there are many failures in our lives. There are many weaknesses are there in our lives. This encourages us to know that we have a God who pardons our sin. As the Apostle John speaks, it's our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins. What a promise fulfilling God. What a comforting words it is for us. What thou hast spoken to the children of Israel in thy faithfulness and in thy promises are true for us in this age, in the grace, in the age of grace. We thank you, Father, for blessing thy servant, O Lord, Brother Benson. Benson we need to pray that the studies that are there before, Lord, it is, it is thy plan for us that we should learn from thy scriptures and to know the greater truths and to be more and more ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the medium by which thou hast given us to Turk, to listen to thy word and to study thy word. Lord, we give thee thanks for all those who are involved in it, all those whom are responsible for this. We pray that the abundant blessing be rest upon them. We pray for those who are hearing thy word, O Lord. Let thy words may just not be only for hearing and to understand and to keep the knowledge, but it is to practice in our life and experience in, the, in our life the nearness and the dearness of our Lord and to be intimate with him and to be closer to him as thou expects us that we should be prepared for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because we, this world is not our home. We are just pilgrims and sojourners on the earth. But we are marching on to that side land where our Lord has promised to take us. If when he comes, he will take us unto himself. If thou tarries to come, O oh Lord, help us, O oh Lord, that the doors that have been opened for us, as thy children, we may gather in thy presence to worship you, to adore you. Tomorrow, week of fathers, all the programs of Turk that is there for our learning may be enriched for each one of us. Once again, we give you thanks for this time. We give you thanks for thy very presence. We thank you for teaching us from thy scriptures. We give all glory and honor to thee. Accept our thanksgiving, our praises and the requests that we put before thee. In the exalted and worthy name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Uncle. May God bless you all. Thanks for joining.